Hello, my name's Tristan. I'm a miniature and a miniature accessory painter. Today, I'm going to teach you how to paint this guy right here. And yes, I will be teaching you how to paint the sexy tech priest on the front. Let us begin, shall we? I begin by priming my model with a coat of Molotow One for All Black. This paint has a great covering power and a satin finish which will boost the shine of the metal components. I spray all over the model and base. I set many of my miniatures of a value sketch to better understand the shapes and volumes, but since I will be painting a great deal as miniature of metals which don't convey this, I skip it here. I like to paint my models attached to a base if I can, but here the model is only pinned and tacked together. I need the versatility to separate the parts and paint them alone. I begin on the metal parts first. I mix a blend of game color charred brown and scale 75 decayed metal. The normal brown helps in a couple of ways. It helps the suspension of metal pigments in the acrylic medium for the airbrush. It grants greater opacity and influences the tone, and it changes the finish to a metallic satin. Metal paints are semi-transparent due to the nature of the metal pigments, and the normal paint helps cover the gaps between them. This also changes the paint's finish, which will contrast the shiny lights that will be coming next. Monument Copper forms the lights. This tone is crazy shiny, akin to polished copper cookware. Since weathering is such a large component to my scheme later, it helps if the surface is high in value so it can shine through the grime. The main body gets based with a flat coat of Vallejo German Camo Dark Green. My scheme leans towards a World War II military theme, and the desaturated tones of many of Vallejo's colors will grant this feeling. Vallejo is also very consistent in matte finish. Here is the secret to the texture of the surface. I use a decal, cut for ease of use, and place it on the surface of the model. I spray German camo beige over the surface, and instantly, I gain a chaotic surface. I spray all around the model, trying my best to hit every shape with a bit of beige, but I don't worry too much if I mess up. I will be coming in later with two more tones, and mistakes can be covered up in the time. I use US Dark Green for variety in the camo effect. I hit a small section on each shape of the model to prevent making the camo effect too consistent. Then I finish it all off with black. This is the most important one. It adds depth to all the colors and brings the effect through. I use black ink for this, simply because it's airbrush ready right out of the bottle. Right now, the surface is a bit chaotic with the satin finish of all these diluted paints and their inconsistency, so I unify the surface now with a bit of matte varnish. A heat gun or a hair dryer is a great tool to speed up your painting. Time for a wet palette. I set down my three basic tones, along with golden carbon black, though I forgot to record this. I first base coat the armor panels. The two thin coats mantra certainly applies here, but what is noteworthy is the manner in how I paint. I work from more complex areas to open areas, following the wet edge. I sometimes see new painters base coat by covering the surface in just any manner that they can. This can lead to a very uneven and patchy layer, as the paint partially cures and is then picked up by the wet brush. By following the wet edge, you have a much better time keeping the paint smooth and consistent. 
I repeat this on the armor panels. I don't worry too much about overspray here, I can cover the mistakes later. Golden Brand Carbon Black on the Cables Since the cables on this model are somewhat hidden and not a focal point, I can cheat and use this very glossy black to grant instant visual interest. This tone also coats the little rubber handles on the sides as well as the lenses on the model. I prepare a dry palette for my metal tones. I mix a bit of flow improver into the paint to give myself a little bit more work time with them. I then cut in all of my metal components, following the wet edge to prevent texture buildup. This takes a bit of time, but it has to be done, so put some cans on and be patient. I then use Monument Copper and do the lights, focusing on the upper parts of every surface of copper. This is also where I do the detail pipes and latches. Their small size don't need to have a base coat in order to stand out. I like to highlight large flat metal surfaces like this with stripes, much like a 2D drawing. Time for the base. I start by setting everything but the rocks up with charred brown. If you're curious as to this dry brushing step, I'll push you in Byron's way at Artist Opus. He explains it much better than I can. The quick of it is, that small pad of foam allows for the paint to remain active and capable of getting onto the model. I coat all the soil with the brown, then add some P3 Minoth white base and begin bringing up the value, finishing the final lights with Minoth white highlight. A large brush covers the stones of dark sea gray. Tan earth for the wood. This is to establish a different texture from the soil. I wet blend a wash of Dragonoff Nightshade and Nong Oil onto the rocks. Same metal process as before on the gears. The base is now based, but the lack of variety in tones makes the base dead and boring. What I need is tonal variety. I proceed with an airbrush here, but you could use glazing. I use Othonian camouflage and some US dark green as a thin glaze and spray some light green filters onto the base. This green will give the impression of plant growth and give a little life to the base. Reichland flesh shade gives the wood extra warmth and variety along the base. I go back in with a brush and glaze in some more defined areas of color. 
I start with a small pile of super glue on a small piece of plastic card that I have lying around. I pull out various materials and swipe them within it to apply to the base, including foam flock, grass tufts and flowers, and birch seeds. White PVA glue is then dabbed on, and small piles of stag grass get pressed on top. What's interesting here is how all these steps add to the base, and bring it from a dead battlefield to a healthy forest in only a few minutes of work. I then marry them all together, and to the base. There's no reason to keep the parts separate at this point. I proceed with decal application, but that's a topic for another video. Time for oxidization. I use phthalo green and titanium white for this. I begin by adding a tiny amount of white spirit to the phthalo green to loosen the color, then cover all of the copper. Phthalo green is a very transparent tone with a high amount of coverage and staining power, which I will use to my advantage here. Titanium white is next. I focus on select areas where moisture would collect on the model, spreading the white around before moving on to the next area. I then use a dry soft brush to blend the two colors around, moving in a vertical motion to impart interesting lines and an impasso effect to the model. I let the model cure overnight before I go in with pyrene black. This is a very dark green tone, and its purpose is to add definition by panel lining all the small recesses of the model. I mix a proper wash this time, using more white spirit, and simply touch the model to give instant definition. I apply the remaining wash to the base in select areas. This helps harmonize the base and model with one another. And now for the freehand. I hope I can talk about this in greater detail in another video, but for now, the basic process is as follows. I start with a basic shape breakdown of the model. I need to ensure I do not get too committed in the beginning and make the freehand too large. I then block in the major shapes of the figure and gain a silhouette. Add a few lines to help give some form to the silhouette. Don't worry about mistakes. You can cover them up with other colors. And if worse comes to worse, you can weather your way to victory. I then block in the major shapes of the robes and fill them in. From here, the painting process is very freeform and challenging to record, so pardon me as we move into slideshow. I proceed by defining the edges and basic volumes of the figure. You can see the terminators here. This is to establish the beginnings of the lights and shadows going forward. I blend the lights and shadows together and increase the lights on the robes. I then add some facial features before moving on to highlights and shadows. Many tutorials can be very processed and orderly, but in reality, painting is very nebulous and far from a paint by numbers kit. That's why I sometimes move on to one area to the next without a lot of reason. I increase the lights to the final value on the rows before adding in some more mechanical aspects to the legs. I then add the gear trim going back and forth between the base color and white to clean the effect. 
I then add facial features. With parts this small, it's helpful to let the paint dry completely before you proceed. Even if you do make a mistake, give it time to dry before you try to correct it, else you risk partially pulling up the paint and creating an ugly texture. And I finalize this with a gear on the color, and then some freehand lettering. Charred brown and gloss varnish will make up the mud for the legs. I begin with a light dry brush of the parts I want to glow with white, and I move between stippling and brushing motions in the direction I want the light to move. I then use P3 Necrotite Green and apply a light green filter over the white. I focus mostly on the surrounding areas more than the center. I then add in fluorescent yellow to the mix with only a small amount of the green and focus on the light center. Fluorescent colors are very transparent and you need light backgrounds to be visible. Normally I would try to show how I do the OSL effect but this video is already quite long, so we're just going to go to the final result here. I know this is a lot of information to take in, but in reality, this is how I paint my own collection of miniatures. The process of actually painting only took about 5 hours. A bit long for a single model, but vehicles are deserving of a higher amount of interest and time. If you like this video, like, comment, and subscribe, and all that the crap. You can ask any questions you like in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer them. Take care.